Okay, again, welcome to Sweden, Stockholm, and Skansen. For those I didn't met yesterday at the icebreaker, my name is Jens, and I work here in Skansen, the zoological department, as the head of education. And, um, well, I have to connect to the day before at the icebreaker. Of course, you have, you have to be nervous when you're planning a such a big conference as this is. And uh, yesterday, I had, of course, a lot to do. And I, have I didn't have time to think about what's going to happen in the, in the night. But I don't know what you say. It was a really nice ice break yesterday, wasn't it? <laughs> Thanks for that. And I know that a lot of you also went down to the pop house afterwards and keep going after that. And hopefully you're not that tired today. Uh, okay, and uh, when you walked up here uh, from the main entrance, you probably saw, you, you, do, you probably don't saw any animals, maybe the small pigs at the children's zoo, but mainly the animals are down in the area around here. And, um, well, you will see more animals definitely on Wednesday and the coming days, of course. But we are not an ordinary zoo. We are an open-air museum with a lot of old buildings as well. I think we have more than 800, <laughs> not 800, 180 old buildings. And this is one of them. It's called Högloftet. What do you think about the building? It's quite old, isn't it? It's nice. Uh, and it's built in um, 1904, so a little bit more than 100 years. And uh, also the other building, uh, w uh, there you have the coffee. It's uh, 20 years younger but still old it is. And okay, we have a lot of animals, and one really famous animal here is uh, a moose that was born. Actually, he, was, uh, he wasn't born here in Skansen. He was born in a small city north of Stockholm. But he moved to Stockholm in 19 and Skansen in 1935, and his name was Pusse. That's the name of the moose. And uh, you can actually feel that he's kind of in here. That's because you see the antlers here from him. So all the antlers, uh, I think it's ah, behind the screen there, when he was two years old. And then he growed up. And you know, uh, in the ages between uh, uh, around 10 years, they are on the, on the top. And then after that, they are kind of retiring. So uh, the antlers are getting smaller. I think it's 19. I think it is. So that's a, li a, di a little bit about one of the famous animals here, called Pusse. Uh, yesterday, you met some of, not my crew, but we have um, a zoo um, association here in Sweden as well, uh, with all the, not all the zoos, but a lot of them. And we have an education group, uh, and we have worked a, a bit, I can say. Of course, I, ha I had worked <laughs> most of it uh, with planning this here in Skansen. But I would like to introduce them, the, that Swedish group. So welcome up here on stage. You met them yesterday with those green sweatshirts. <laughs> and actually, none of them are working at Skansen, even if they had the green sweatshirts yesterday and says they are working at Skansen, but they don't. First, we have Linda. And maybe if you can uh, show the, the map on the screen. If it's coming. OK, it's maybe coming later. But Linda, there it is. And I show me where you home park this, isn't it? Yeah, where you work? Around there? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, that's me. <laughs> well. There? Okay, Jervsa. There's Linda from Jervsa. And then we have Björn. He's from Kolmården, and he's going to take care of 60 people around that on Friday. 
we have run to the bus, and he, uh, I think it's, oh, yeah, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> so Bjorn is head of, head of education there in Kolmodan. And Luis, where are you working? Park and Sue, Eskilstuna, kind of middle of Sweden. And then I have this Marie. Da oh, d down there. <laughs> the south of south in Sweden. In uh, Ista, Animal Park. And then Eric. Boros. Okay, thanks. And what about you, Fredrik? Where are you from? Stockholm. You're okay. He's uh, actually also from Stockholm, but he's not working in the zoo. You're working in a gymnasium here in, uh, in Stockholm, called Sponga Gymnasium. And uh, we have a lot of collaborations with them and also other schools as well. Uh, you saw Real, Real Gymnasiet, they are sponsoring this a bit. So they are also here. And we have Eva. On the west coast, she's coming from Nordens Ark, right? That's it. Yeah, thanks. Have a seat again. <laughs> a small things you have to say when you are building like this. Um, the emergency exits are behind me in case of fire or something else. Um, behind there and take the stairs down and of course the main, main entrance. I think I recommend that way if something happens. Uh, and uh, something else. Yeah, the workshops. Most of you have already signed up yesterday at the icebreaker, but it's I, I know it's still uh, some spaces left. So sign up, please, down there. Or where is it now, Eric? Still down there at the registration desk. Uh, and also there was something about the, um, the quest, uh, we have a question bo box. Ah, you can talk about that, good. So I think it's time for me to hand over the microphone to our CEO, John Brattner. Welcome up. Thank you. <laughs> and welcome to Stockholm and uh, you, Gordon, and Skansen. Uh, Jens told me, I think two years ago, that you were coming here, and I asked him just one thing. Please come within summer, at least when it's greener at Skansen. And since then, he has struggled with this conference with his partners. I'm really proud of you. I have never been shown where to go when I'm going to wish somebody welcome, but this morning I was. <laughs> That's impressive. Uh, telling you a little about bit uh, about you, Gordon, it's a quite unique thing in Europe. We are about 50 actors here. You met Pop House yesterday. I'm going to call the manager after this, telling him to open the bar a little bit longer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if I <laughs> succeed because the regulations are quite hard here in Sweden, but I can't see why you are supposed to leave at 9.30. I'm sorry for that. But we gather uh, about 15 million visitors on a yearly basis here, and that makes us bigger than the Chinese, Chinese wall together. And that's impressive. And we tell every decision maker in Stockholm and otherwise that we are quite important, having people to Sweden and Stockholm, and so uh, making the transportation work. And yeah, you see, you understand. And we are also located in a national park. We are the event part of the national park. So we have to do everything within the nature, as yeah, it's not so hard for us because that's what we do. And all about us here at Skansen, it's in fact education. We always tell you about our founder, it's Arthur Hazelius. He founded Skansen in 1891. 
and it's the world's first open air museum. We are in fact the role model for open air museums in the world. And there's quite a lot of them. Uh, it's 300,000 square meters who has to be clean and safe every day around the year. We are about 200 yearly employees. And we add that number with five, 600 within our peak seasons. It, uh, yeah, we have to have a lot of employees to make this uh, some, yeah, to, to make it an uh, exhibition. Um, we have about 1.4 visitors on a yearly basis. Last year was not so good. We have a hot summer and we lost about 90,000 visitors only in June. So since then we have been quite poor. I hope you not you not noticed that, but that's a fact. And we have about 250 million Swedish crowns revenue. And uh, the crown is quite weak now, but it's uh, it's a middle size company here in Sweden. And we just have 29% from the states, from the state, and that means that we have to be quite business oriented oriented in everything we do. Yeah. Yeah. Much of what we are doing here is based on Art Vesalius' vision. Um, in the historic Skansen, we show how uh, people have lived in the older days. And uh, our colleagues in those environments are properly dressed and well, well educated and they bring the guests to the historic epoch that the house represents. You see the <laughs> woman there, she has a dress from I think country Dalarna and in peak time we have a dress chamber who dresses the employees three times a day going in shift. We have more than 100,000 pieces of clothes there. Yeah. This is my colleagues from the historic department and the zoo department trying to show how people lived back in time, taking their animals to, to the summer visit. And we do that several times every summer, trying to remember all the traditions of Sweden. Here is the Coop store. We sell milk and show how they do did it uh, uh, about 70, 80 years ago. In fact, we also sell ice there to the refrigerators and so on. Try to make an illusion of how we have developed and look back and try to get the audien audience to understand what life has been in this country. This Oh, I'm, don't I'm shaky, perhaps. This is a marble, marvelous picture. Uh, she shows how, is, how the post was done in the, po in the past, when the post worked here in Sweden, doesn't now. Everything we do, we have a children's perspective on most everything, and we have a lot of playgrounds and so. And uh, yeah, that's simple. If you get the children to Laos guns and the parents come and the grandparents come and they will return. That's, I think, the most import important business idea of us here at Skans. Uh, Jens has told me you don't have to speak about the animals, so I will not. Uh, but I have to tell you that 10 years ago, the plants around the animals were very bad here. We had uh, exempt exceptions for almost all from o our authorities. And uh, today we have facilities that need meets all requirements for modern animal housekeeping. And uh, that's the reason why we dare to have you here because we are rather proud of uh, what we have done the last years. We have struggled to keep a good animal welfare, welfare, and I think we are there now. 
and uh, I, th I know that everybody working here is very glad for that. It was quite a shame for it 10 years ago. And uh, we I promise to not talk about animals, but please ask Jens or any other of my staff about the uh, European bison, because then we will be extremely proud and tell you the story, promise you. And then uh, you have the, the, the children's zoo just in the neighborhood. That's also a building who has celebrated, I think, five years. And uh, I think it's the most meaningful I've been a part of. Uh, when you have a population in the urban, urban city, they don't know the... Yeah, they think the milk is dumb behind the fridge where they buy it and tell the story about the hen and the egg and the bacon and the pig, that makes a difference. Uh, I'm a country boy, I ha have this for free, but nowadays they haven't. And I think you know everything about that. This is our new stage. I think it's the most modern in Europe. And um, we have uh, very often broke cost programs from this in summertime. I call it the national stage in Sweden in summer summertime. And the program is very important for us. We have about more, more than 2,000 of them on a yearly basis. And uh, the most yes, known one is a sing-along contest called Allsom på Skansen. We have had, it had that for 84 years. And uh, that's the most popular TV program also so far. But we do a lot here and uh, we are very glad to have that opportunity. I hope, yeah, you could see it when you have the dinner the day after tomorrow. Um, you, you will also, yeah, the green scans, and as I love to talk about, it's not so green yet, but in summertime it looks like that. And we have uh, flowers and trees from all over Sweden. So even there, we are Sweden in miniature. And we try to teach about that too. It's all about learning, Skansen. And uh, we have a lot of gardens and so, from the very north to the very south. We also celebrate every Swedish tradition here. And we try to invite the new Swedes to learn about us, how we have de developed and uh, yeah, we are quite su successful there too. We ha have two peak se seasons, of course in summertime, but also in December when we celebrate Christmas every day. So when we go home, we don't want to hear about Christmas and all the food. We have uh, the, the model of that celebration is from 1902. 1902. So we celebrate the market as it were then, and we have about 25,000 guests every weekend in, the, in that program. Uh, I also want to tell you about the biggest holiday, it's midsummer. We have about 30,000 guests here then, if it's not raining. You really get humble when you have the sky as the roof. Because if it's rain, it's just about eight, ten thousand. We have you. S have you? Do you know who we celebrate midsummer? <laughs> we raise a maple and we dance around it and we drink vodka and uh, sing and uh, really celebrate the summer is coming. It's here now. We have uh, seven restaurants. I think you will have. Uh, you will try at least two of them. In and uh, they are all leased. It's a bit of struggle to keep the keep the food in the class we want, but now I think it's quite okay. Um, we are going to celebrate the, the dinner the day after tomorrow here, and don't forget to look on the view. You will see a nice view of Stockholm there. It's it's quite nice, and and I promise you the bar will not close that night. Uh, at last, we also have uh, shops here, and 
we are proud that we have uh, based our own collection from Skansen selling all over Sweden with a message, please come and visit us. Look in our store there in the main entrance and you will see what I am talking about. And yesterday you were the very first to visit the Baltic Sea Science Center. It isn't really finished yet. It will be within two weeks and that is the biggest uh, uh, th that's the biggest we have done so far. And that is also uh, all about education. I am sure that Jens told you about the uh, vision and the ideas yesterday, so I will not repeat that. But I hope this will be one of our, our attractions, even in wintertime when we have a roof. We need roofs here. Yeah, I hope you will have a great time here at Skansen and I so I'm sure that we will take good care about you and if there is any questions you can yeah I see you look on the watch ask Jens don't ask me thank you have a good time <laughs> okay thanks a lot John uh, now we have learned a lot about Skansen and small things about animals I promise to tell you more about um, European bison later and uh, I didn't tell you that much about um, the lessons here in the Baltic Sea yesterday. But on uh, Wednesday, tomorrow it is, uh, we're going to have um, a walk around Skansen for two hours. So we have four different timings. You will know that later in Skansen, no, in <laughs> Baltic Sea tomorrow. And Anna and Sophia, you met them yesterday. And they're going to show you around if you want to see the Baltic Sea tomorrow. I think it's time now for my fun way from the Alta office. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Can you all hear me? I can see some of you at the back, it gets a bit dark. <laughs> Super, okay, well, welcome everybody. It is, uh, I feel like I'm a bit loud now. Um, it is lovely to see so many familiar faces, but also an awful lot of new ones as well. Um, those of you that know me uh, know I'm a little bit of a data geek. I love my numbers, and also I really love my numbers to be quite big. Uh, the bigger, the better, because for me, IAZ is all about our community. We have strength in numbers. We can learn so much from each other. And so for me, numbers, big numbers are important. And indeed, we are a big community. We talk about being the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, but actually, as you can see from our member map here, we are more than just Europe, more than Europe and the Middle East. We have members that are spreading across the world. Just how many members? Do we have anybody wanting to have a guess? about where we're at. Everybody's quiet this morning. Okay, 416 members in 49 countries. So close to 50, so close to 50 countries. But maybe, maybe in two years' time, when we have our next education conference, we'll have beaten that 50. But as I said, for me, this is really important because it, it signifies the strength and indeed the diversity of our community. But this is our members, and in Paris, this is how many people we had from our different institutions and our different countries. So what do we think about here today, two years on? Have we managed to make those numbers any bigger? Much more, much more. Well, we have indeed. Yep, so actually we did have 100, uh, 200 people registered and a couple of people pulled out at the last minute. So I, oh, so close. Um, but um, uh, more people, more institutions, fewer countries though. Not happy. But actually, looking at the data, because any good scientist will know it's not just about the number, but the story behind the number, what we see with fewer countries is more people from the same institution. And I think that's an also an excellent story to tell, because people are sending not just one, but two or three or four members of staff to these events. And again, that's showing the value of the information uh, that we're sharing and the topics and the concepts that we're talking about. And I think that's a really good thing to be proud about. 
Another set of numbers that I like to share is the numbers about our professional development and training, our IASA Academy. So these are the numbers for people that went through Academy courses last year in 2018. And I was super pleased to hear everybody at the icebreaker that attended the course yesterday have such positive things to say. They were inspired, maybe a little bit nervous about how they're going to go on and do evaluation in their collections. But it was su super good to have so many people attending that training. Other opportunities for training is the European Professional Zookeeper Qualification Framework, EPSCIF, really handy there. I won't talk too much about this because I know that Laura, our Academy Manager, will be talking about it later on in the programme, but I do want to highlight this as a very useful resource for training and development as well. Now, everything we do within IASA fits within our strategy. We're halfway through our current strategic period, and there are four focal areas under our strategy. I'm just going to take a little bit of our time today to highlight some of the education-related activities under our four focal areas. And the first one I'm going to focus on is having healthy populations and individuals with positive welfare. Because at the end of the day, what makes us unique are the animals we have in our collections. And we need to make sure that we have sustainable and healthy animals, healthy individuals in our collections. And as I said, the heart of that is our EEPs and our ESBs, our population management programs. And as you can see, when we started, we've really grown those programs, grown those programs, up to having about 400 programs between the EEPs and the ESBs uh, where we are today. And that's all very well and good, but things have changed over those 30 years. And so part of the previous strategy, and indeed this current one, was to, to plan for the future, to take a look at what we're doing and saying, are these programs still fit for purpose? Are they doing what we want? Are they supporting the animals in our care? And when we did that um, analysis, we actually realized that a lot of our populations weren't sustainable. We weren't able to keep those populations going into the future with the current format that we had. Also, I love that picture of the cats. We also realized that not every species fits into the population program that we have. Not every species fits in the box for managing them. And also, as we are sadly aware, there are more and more species out there that need our help, more and more species in need of conservation through zoo work. Things like uh, group living species in terms of some of our birds, our amphibians, uh, how we manage a population of seahorses can also be very complex. And you're not entirely sure who the mother is, who the father is, where those offspring have come from, and what you're going to do with hundreds and hundreds of offspring. So we needed to think about a new model, our kind of one-size-fits-all is not working for us anymore. So we're doing that over here in zoos and aquariums. We're being very reflective. We're looking at our programs. We're evaluating what's going on with them. Over in the in situ community, they're doing exactly the same thing. They're looking at their populations in the wild, looking at their conservation strategies and saying, is this really working? And as we all know, if you have a group of people working on something over here and a group of people working on something over there and they're not talking, then you can end up with a lot of confusion a lot of duplicate work, or work that contradicts each other. And so what we're looking to do with IASA is bring those two communities together, our ex-situ uh, um, ex zoo community and the in-situ conservation community. And that leads us to this cycle, and this comes from the IUCN, where we're looking at assessing what we have through the reg list, through our programs in our collections. We're working with those SSG, Species Survival Commission specialist groups, to think about a one plan. So we're moving away from one size fits all to a one plan, individual plan for the different species that we hold in our collections. And of course, there's no point having a plan if you don't act on it. And that's the final part of that cycle. And then, of course, you evaluate, you uh, develop your plan, and you act again. So what does this mean for us as IASA? And then more importantly, you as educators. You think, well, this is the animal stuff. That's not my, my role. That's somebody else's. But for you, it's important to know that we're moving towards having a single term for all of our population management programs. It's still EEP, but much easier for me to say than the German, which I'm not even going to try. We're now an IASA ex situ program. So it's one term for all the population management programs we have. But really importantly, each of those programs is individually structured to the needs of that species. So we need to manage our tigers in one way, that program is going to be managed in that way and have set rules relating to that program. We need to manage our seahorses in a totally different way. 
then that will still be an EEG, but it may well be managed in a different way that's appropriate for that condition. Again, well, that's interesting, Navantni, but you know, what does that mean for me as an educator? Well, what it means is that when we're trying to work out what the best plan is for each of the species, we now are working through our regional collection planning process. And this is where we get each of the stakeholders from any area we feel is appropriate together in the room to think about which species we should be having in our Iaga collections. The picture here, I do love it. This is the canid and hyenid ones. Um, and they looked at all of the canid and hyenid species and worked out which ones we should be keeping and why. And the important thing here is that then during this workshop, we say, well, what are, the th what are the threats facing this species? What is the role and the goal that we can have for Iaga? So to give you an example here of the spotted hyena, we could see that a big threat was actually that people don't really like hyenas. They don't care about them enough. They're an amazing, fascinating animal, but people don't really care. We need to educate them to help people with the conservation element. And that's where you guys come in, because then the RCP is saying, well, part of the spotted hyena the reason it's in our collection, the work we need to do, is around this education role. And it's not just the animal people in the room saying they need an education role. We also need to have educators in the, role say in the room saying, well, that's okay, but what does that mean for us as educators on the ground? When we're saying we need a targeted educational program for hyenas in Iaga collections, what's that going to look like? How is that going to impact on your work? Indeed, how are you going to find out about that? And so this is something that is um, important for you. And indeed, the education committee now has a, a role within there. I'm looking at Sarah. I don't want to steal the thunder because Sarah will tell you more about that. Look at that. Nicely linking up our talks there. But that's how our kind of animal population management programs are linking into your work as educators, really wanting to have that one plan approach so that we can all work together to be the best for species in our care. Of course, as educators, you do like information. We want you to have the best and most up-to-date information about species. And we have a whole host of best practice guidelines. These are being continually published on a whole range of species available from our website. You can find out important things about the species biology, how we look after the species, the best kind of husbandry, all useful things for you to use if you're talking to your guests or visitors or developing programs. The other set of uh, best practice guidelines that we have are to do with demonstration animals. And again, this is another area where I'm sure many of you might be involved in presentations or demonstrations with animals. If you're not leading them yourself, you may be talking about them while the keepers are doing those demonstrations. And we have had our general guidelines on the use of animals in, in demonstrations documents. And when it comes to the Yaga documents, we talk about our guidelines being strongly recommend to do. This is what we would like our members to do with the idea being that our guidelines lead the way for people to maybe change their practices if they need some time to maybe change the demonstration that they're working with. They need to maybe change the uh, physical uh, aspect of that demonstration. They might need to change the company or speak with the company that's delivering that demonstration. But now in our IAGA annual general meeting coming up um, in a couple of weeks, we're proposing that these guidelines become standards. And that turns them into a must do. That turns them into something that is assessed at our accreditation and members are required to follow. So again, that's really important for you as educators if you're involved in those programs to take a look at the current guidelines, be aware that they're going to become standards and involve them and check that what you're doing is following those standards. We also then have taxa specific guidelines and this just adds a bit more information about species specific elements that might be going on in a demonstration. There's one for felids and there's one for falconiforms and strigiforms. I like those sort of birds of prey and raptors. And we also have ones coming on uh, uh, marine mammals and elephants and parrots. So keep an eye out on the website for those. They're really useful guidance documents for how we should be interacting with animals in public demonstration. I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about our, our uh, other focal area to do with representation at the EU and with uh, stakeholders. And specifically, I would like to talk about our two position statements that we uh, published last year. And our position statements are what IAGA thinks on a topic. They're a very strong document for us to use with politicians. Um, uh, rightly or wrongly, or happily or sadly, I suppose, these two are to do with trade, because one of the biggest threats facing species at the moment is trade. We recognize that. We have our current campaign on Asian songbirds, so we have a strong position statement on what we feel uh, politicians and what we feel the situation should be to try and protect 
songbirds and keep them out of illegal trade, but also another one on tigers and tiger parks coming through Europe as well. And for you as educators, maybe you have some friends that are politicians, maybe you are involved in that lobby work and you can use these, but they also act as a really useful tool to talk to visitors, to members of the public, to other stakeholders about what IATA thinks about topics, or when somebody says, well, I've heard about something to do with the trade in tigers, what do you think, what's going on with that? So these are documents for you to use as well. And the other political document that I want to mention is our manifesto. We're heading into the European elections um, in the next couple of months, and our manifesto sets out what IASA feels is important for those politicians going into those elections. What we would like them to do in terms of legislation for biodiversity and animal care in the future. And again, as educators, you might be ready to take this to your politician, that would be fabulous, but actually it contains a lot of really useful information about legislation that impacts on biodiversity and where IASA thinks we need to go with that, and that can also be useful for you. Our, our third area that I'm going to talk about is about communicating our work, both internally, so we as IASA members know what's going on, but also externally, so the outside world can see all the fantastic things we're doing. We have an IASA WhatsApp presentation, a PowerPoint, which gives um, a really good overview of the structure of IASA, how our committees work, how we make decisions. That's available on our member area. I definitely know that people have used that within their own institutions and at um, other events, meetings like this. So that's a really useful presentation if you're not quite sure how things work or you want to tell other people how the IASA structures work, especially I know we have some uh, uh, zookeeper training uh, colleges and, and universities in the room. This is a really useful one. You can just pull it off and you can use it to tell your students how IASA works. That's very helpful. Also, we have a range of externally facing short videos as well. One about what is IASA, and then a whole host of others on different aspects of our programming. These are available from the IASA website, but also on the IASA YouTube channel. And then this is one I'm gonna look across because hopefully I can take like a minute, 50 seconds to show you the one about conservation education. Yeah. Please, that worked. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we see, see the different YouTube things. Um, so I would absolutely like to thank everybody that provided um, uh, pictures and images for use in that video. It is freely available. I'd encourage you to use it and to share it. And if you would want translated versions, we can definitely work on that as well. I know we've done that for some of the others, so definitely talk about it there. Um, the other area where we are very proud within IASA is our Journal of Zoo and Aquarium Research, which is an open access, freely available peer-reviewed journal for us to share our work. 
I picked three uh, kind of examples from recent Gaze Art issues just to highlight the diversity of research that's in there. The first one was about reintroduction planning and the genetic assessment, the science that we use behind that. I like this second one for two reasons, actually. One, because it comes from research carried out in uh, American zoos, so it's great to see that they're sharing their data in a European journal. But also it's talking about mortality, and I think sometimes as educators we can struggle with how much do we talk to our guests about uh, you know, animal death or animal illness. And I think we shouldn't shy away from saying that you know, we do give our animals the best care possible, but sometimes they die, and what are the reasons for that? We need to investigate that. We need to be open and transparent that we're conducting research to improve things all the time. And this last one here was an example of what I would say is an education-linked one, but I'm going to issue a challenge because I had to really struggle to find education-based research in Gazar. And in two years' time, I would love to have three, four, five examples of education research that's been published in Gazar in the last two years. So my challenge to you is to help me fill this side for the next uh, for the next time I do this presentation with your own research. And last but not least, I'm aware that I'm eating into time, <laughs> but I do, of course, want to talk about conservation impact because all of the work we do is to make a difference to the conservation of the species we care about. And one of the things that's very important for us is our conservation database. So we encourage our IASA members to not only do conservation, but it's about the data, it's about recording it and entering the information into the conservation database. But it also provides members that are unsure about where, what kind of conservation they want to do or if somebody else is working in that area to search the database and see, oh, there's already somebody that's working on this species. Maybe I should collaborate with them. And we highlight the uh, uh, um, projects that are in our database in a range of different ways, through our monthly e-news, on the main website, and indeed through our Facebook. So this not only highlights the great conservation work that we do, but again, for you as educators, if you're looking for conservation examples to share with your guests, it provides a great resource for doing that. It also provides me with some data. And this means that I can go to politicians, I can go to external stakeholders when people are saying, so Iyaza, what are you doing for conservation? How are your members impacting on conservation? And I can say, well, they gave 63 million euros to conservation over the past few years. This is the sum total of projects in the database. But it's not just about money. It's about working with partners because we recognize that there are lots of different skills out there. We need to partner up. We also work in a whole range of regions throughout the world on a multitude of different projects. So I would encourage people to put their projects into the database because, again, there's not that many education-related projects in the database. But I know from talking to you that a lot of you are involved in conservation education, either locally in your own countries or developing conservation education in situ around the world as well. And so you should have somewhere in your organization, if you don't know about it, a conservation contact whose role it is to work with the office to help put data in here. So go and track down that person, or indeed come and speak to me or Mirko or Laura, and we can provide you with the contact in the EASA office to try and link that up. Because again, I would love to see some education projects in this database too. I do just want to mention our Silent Forest campaign. I know we have a whole session for it coming up as part of our program, but I'm super pleased and proud about how well this campaign has gone, and I couldn't miss the opportunity to highlight it in my presentation here. And if you want to know more, um, we have a range of ways you can keep up to date. News on the main IASA page is updated with what's going on. You can see a range of different things here about the work that IAS is doing with Barcelona Zoo to try and address the problems that they're facing now and the threats to them, some questions about animal welfare institutions, and indeed our manifesto. So definitely look at the news pages on the main website. If you're an IAS a member, you can sign up for that monthly e-news I mentioned. This is a, an e-news digest that comes into your email once a month. You need to email Monica here and she can add you to that list. We need to be GDPR compliant about our data. I love it, and the European Union doesn't let me share it so easily. But that is a great way to find out about upcoming conferences, events, those best practice guidelines, what's happening within EASA. So definitely sign up to the e-news as a member. And of course, we're active on social media as well. Hopefully, you've all uh, liked us and are following us on Facebook. We have a LinkedIn company page as well that you can find information on. And I did want to highlight um, one thing that we've been doing this past year, which is our Discover EASA members. So once a month, 
we have a short, um, uh, or rather a long interview with one of our members about an aspect of their work, and we put it into a three kind of questions to discover our members. And I, I, I met her last night, so I feel I'm going to mispronounce her name horrendously, but Noreen Burke here from Galway Atlantica was one of our uh, interviewees to represent the education work that's going on. And we are looking for more Discover EASA member stories for the upcoming years. So if you have an exciting or innovating idea you want to talk about through our monthly Discover Our Members, then come and talk to me about it. And this is it. The last thing, we've done all this work. It's amazing. But for me, I'm already thinking two years ahead to our next EASA strategy, because I feel we've done an awful lot in this current strategy. And our current vision is about being the most dynamic, innovative, and effective zoo and aquarium membership organization in Europe and the Middle East. And for me personally, I think we're there. I think we've achieved that vision. I think we're pretty awesome as EASA. The faces in the room here demonstrate to me your interest in being awesome, in being part of EASA. And what I'd like to spend the next couple of days with you thinking about, if we've achieved this, where do we want to go next? So I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, my fun way. Um, now we know everything about YASA and how it works. And uh, I think we have to hand over directly to Sarah. And uh, sorry to say, Sarah, but you have 15 minutes now. That's how it is. Oh, perfect. I'm going, hello. Uh, I'm going for one of these microphones because I have too much hair for the, uh, the other one. Uh, and I'm going to set myself a timer. Good. <laughs> so I keep to time. Brilliant. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Thomas. Um, I'm uh, the current chair of the EASA Education Committee. Uh, I'm a freelance conservation consultant, but I did want to say my thanks to Norden's Ark um, because for the last three months they have given me institutional support to be able to um, carry on my duties um, uh, for the Education Committee. And one of the big duties was to organize this conference. So thanks very much. So, um, Way back when, maybe a year or so ago, uh, we were thinking about what this conference would be. Uh, and what I do remember, certainly from conversations with the Swedish zoo educators, was they didn't want it to be looking in the past. They didn't want it just to be a show and tell. They wanted it to have a future focus. And my family touched on that right at the end. Where do we want to go? And so these are the themes that we came up with. So when you were applying for talks and posters and workshops, you would have filled in your applications under these headings. And it, it really shows how far we've come in the last few years in terms of uh, looking at the sustainable development goals, looking at standards, looking at a whole host of different aspects of conservation education. Uh, so I'm really pleased that we're here. Um, the, the kind of plan worked, uh, and I'm looking forward to all the different kind of programs um, over the next few days. One of the other things we did decide was um, we had so many people who wanted to speak that we went for lots of short talks instead of a few long ones. So I'm really sorry you only have seven minutes to for your presentations, but there's so much great stuff going on in Europe that we wanted to make sure that um, kind of came through. To give you an idea of why we're all here, um, this is our conservation education mission uh, for IASA. This is part of the documentation that was launched uh, maybe three years ago. Uh, and hopefully, you know it well, you live and breathe it in your day-to-day -day lives. And if you don't, then this is a really easy way for you to start learning more about it. Um, this is my favorite slide over the last three years. Um, it talks about the EASA conservation education standards. So for anybody who's listening at home, your next task is to Google these to, to see what they are. Um, it's been a long journey. We launched them in 2016, uh, and I feel that this conference is a, a product of all the great things that have happened uh, since then. Um, there are 20 standards. Uh, they're split into five different areas, uh, going right from the top, from the organizational culture and mission, uh, through the programming and content, to our facilities and infrastructure. Although this is one of the greatest kind of conference venues I've ever been in, 
Somebody said it's like Game of Thrones or kind of Gaston's Lodge in Beauty and the Beast. Um, it talks about professional development. You know, we have more people here than ever before. And so for me, that's a real demonstration that zoos are really committing to educators having support for professional development. And I and uh, my colleagues spent the whole day talking about evaluation yesterday with 60 participants, one of the biggest courses we've ever had. And so again, it really shows how we're committing to these different standards. I don't do this alone. I have a whole host of different people on the committee. Um, committee members, could you stand up if you can? It's quite a dark room. Hopefully you can match the names and faces. I think we've got most people here. They deserve a massive round of applause. Thank you. The way that uh, EASA works, it has different uh, baskets. So you've got different regions. And so we make sure that uh, we have each region represented equally. Uh, and so the, there's different roles and responsibilities. There's different actions we can do. And we did mention a new person. So Steve is here. Give us a wave, Steve. There he is. So Steve has a, a brand new role. We've never had this role in the committee before. Um, and it really is to link up the conservation education, you educators, to the animal collections, to the animal staff. And so um, he has been recently appointed. I know he's got uh, discussions, an open space, hopefully, uh, tomorrow, and also wants to talk to many of you about how he can be more involved in the regional collection planning and the long-term management planning for a variety of different species. Uh, my family mentioned the hyenid tag, and I um, helped out with some discussions in the EASA conference at Athens, and we had great conversations about how we could join up all the different zoos that have hyenas and what kind of messages we could have. And so I've got great hopes for Steve and the kind of work he's going to be doing over the next few years. Uh, there are some changes to the committee. So you can see there's a few spaces. Uh, Maria, where is Maria? There she is at the back. Maria's going to retire from Barcelona Zoo. We wish you well, Maria. Um, and we've also had Amy, who stepped down because the Let It Grow campaign has finished. And you'll see there I am at the top. And for the next three days, I'm still the chair of the Education Committee, and then I also will be stepping down. So if any of you want to be more involved in the committee, there'll be some spaces, opportunities, and hopefully in the next few months, we'll get some news out about how you can be more involved. A lot of people say, well, what do you do in the committee? Well, here's just a few different things that we do. So we meet twice a year. You may have arrived yesterday for the icebreaker, but all the committee were here bright and early on Sunday morning to spend the whole day talking about all different aspects of conservation education and our work. We produce support materials and resources. Uh, we talked a lot about supporting uh, EASA accreditation screening. Uh, we support uh, Lucia uh, in the Silent Forest campaign resources. We deliver training. Uh, we've agreed some new terms of reference for our committee to make sure they are up to date. And we also inputted into the EASA strategy. So thinking forward, what kind of things can we put together? And we organized this conference, which was no small feat. So I'm really pleased that we have such a productive committee. The picture on the right-hand side is the, um, the program from the open session at the conference in Athens in September. So we had 12 speakers in two hours, which is, again, we've never had that many. So lots of people want to talk about conservation education in EASA zoos. Just two examples of training that I've been involved in in the last year. Um, one was, uh, I'm, I'm going to forget the French names, I'm really sorry. So CPFZ and AD, no, that's, I've got that wrong, two French zoo associations. <laughs> uh, one that we did some training about how they could comply with the EASA conservation education standards. Uh, I learned lots of French to deliver that, and we had a great day working together. And I also gave a talk to the French zoo director organization about why the conservation education standards were important to zoo directors. So we're really going from lots of different levels to make sure that people know what we do and how we do it uh, in EASA. I also wanted to go a bit broader. Now we have uh, Isaac in the room. Give us a wave, Isaac. Oh, he's in the middle. Morning, Isaac. So Isaac is a brand new person for WAZA and ISAD. He's the education director. 
I think many of you met him yesterday. He was giving out his cards, having conversations. I've put his email address on there. And it's about working together with IZD and WAZA uh, to look at conservation education more broadly. I put the dates so if you're really keen. There's a conference in 2020 in San Diego. And also, I'm the current IZD rep for Europe and the Middle East. Again, I'm stepping down. So there's another opportunity for you to apply and uh, be in more involved at an international level. We also gave away some bursaries. Um, we were so successful with the Paris conference uh, that we decided that we wanted to support four different people going to the IZD conference in Aline in October. So uh, two were from France and two were from uh, a more broad international kind of pool. Um, three out of four gave posters. Here are a few slides of them kind of giving their feedback. Um, I think anybody who attends a conference, and I hope that you'll feel the same after being here, there's so many things that happen, so many different things that you find out, networks, conversations, new ideas. Noreen is here, so again, uh, you can have a chat to her about her experiences and whether you'd like to take part in the future conferences. Here are two French colleagues in French, for anybody who speaks French. And I just wanted to move on to the Facebook group. I was looking at the conference two years ago where we actually launched the Facebook group. And here we are live streaming. And I put this morning we had, because I checked it, 1,044, but I also uh, let in about six more people before we started. So it's an ever-growing group of people. I hope you find it useful. Uh, certainly with the live streaming, it's a great addition to our conference. People ask questions, there's discussions. If you are a Twitterer, this is our hashtag. Uh, so make sure you use that throughout the conference. But um, if you're not a member of the Conservation Education Facebook group, please do that now. Sign up for the workshops. Uh, we have one from Laura, Pele, Antoinette, Andy, Mario, Tomislav. And the bottom one, number seven, might be full from Jess. Number seven is full. You can't have that one. But you need to sign up for the workshops. And the sign-up sheet is downstairs. And then we also have open space sessions. Now, if you've never had one of these before, it means you can talk about anything. So if you've got a really important topic that you, want, you think 200 people should talk about, you can make a suggestion. From the feedback from last year, we've made it a lot longer. I think it's two hours that we have uh, to discuss in our groups. I've already had four different people have a topic they want to put forward. So there's a box uh, down on the registration desk, and you need to put your topic on the card. There's some post-it notes down there. Um, put your name on it as well. We'll sort through those, and then we'll come back together, and we'll kind of show you the different topics, and then you can choose which of the groups you want to go into. So this is not part of the plan program. You know, This is not a, a talk that somebody's going to give. This is your opportunity to talk about what you want to talk about. There are great experiences. You can move around, talk to lots of different people, and that all happens tomorrow. I always have this as a, a slide, uh, and we've got some great props this year. Um, so this is usually for the uh, English, American, Australian people. Uh, we have 34 different countries, probably as many different languages, and so we've got to make sure we're nice and slow. But this year we've got, so if you get shown the moose, you're going too quickly. But don't take offense if you get shown the moose because uh, one of the first things that I always like to say is if you can't understand what's going on, then there's probably somebody else who can't understand what's going on. So uh, if you're a speaker and you see this, please slow down. If you're in the audience and people are going too quickly, uh, you could make a noise like a moose, you could stand up, <laughs> you could have some antlers. Um, ple please do participate. Yes, Christian, yeah, thank you. Um, say something because we're all here together for the next few days to make sure that we have a, a, a really great time. We also have, if you're a speaker, uh, three minute warning is the wolf and uh, stop is the owl. So we've got different cards for different things. Um, I just wanted to, one last thing was to thank Skansen and the Swedish Zoo educators. If you've walked around, yeah, this is my favorite building. It's like a house on stilts and I think it's, uh, you know, it shows that it really does take a village a huge number of people, the EASA staff, the educators, the committee, to actually make this conference happen. Um, if you're here for the first time, in fact, stand up if you're here for the first time as a new person. This is your very first conference. 
Fantastic. So that, that's a lot of you. Okay, you can sit down. So I like to say, um, try and meet everybody. You could play delegate bingo, tick everybody off. I got a full house last year. Um, if you see somebody on their own, go and talk to them. If you've been here before, go and make friends, talk to as many people as possible. These are your opportunities to have great conversations with fellow zoo educators. So I hope you have a fantastic conference. Um, and I will probably see you at some point later today because I'm on every day. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. I totally agree with everything you said about Skansen and about those conferences. It's an awesome uh, conference, of course. And uh, it's an honor to present uh, one of our keynote speaker. And I think it's Yago. Welcome up. I think you will present yourself a little bit more later. But I know that you start working in Lisbon Zoo. Well, it's not Lisbon. <laughs> He started working in Lisbon Zoo as an educator, but now he's not working there. He's doing something totally else. All right, here we go. And yeah. you will explain that for the audience. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Can I get that maximum? Okay, yeah. Um, if the just let the quick. So yes, yeah, so thank you very much, everyone. It's um, it's really a pleasure to um, to be here to talk to all of you um, about a, a topic that I'm particularly passionate about, and that is um, what does the future of education in zoos look like, um, and what should we be aiming at, right? So I think we 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 heard from one of the previous speakers that if we look at the strategy, um, uh, uh, some of the strategies the ASUS already uh, uh, set out, we're pretty much there. What does the future mean? What are we aiming to achieve? And so I'm gonna. Hopefully, you know, try to give 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 out some thought provoking ideas so we can all uh, think about what this what does this look like um, in, in the future. And so, yes, my name is Joe Verissimo. Um, I have the both pleasure and um, um, duty to represent these two institutions, University of Oxford and San Diego Zoo. Um, and so, without further ado, I'll just give you some sense of what my presentation is going to look like. So I'm going to have four parts. One is going to be a little bit more towards the past, not too much of that. Second bit, more about the present. The third and fourth, thinking about setting out what the future might look like. Um, and, and I'm trying to make sure that I'll have enough time for, for questions at the end, because I think really that's the value, the value of us being all here. Otherwise, you know, we could just look at each other's slides or, or, or tweet at each other or something like that. So. Um, you've already heard it today. Um, what makes zoos unique um, is, is the animals. Right? It's, it's in the zoo word, right? The clue is in the word. Um, and so um, it's really about the animals first. And I'll, I'll start a little bit of with a little bit of my, my own personal story of what connects me to zoo education. I started out um, as an educator at 17 in Lisbon Zoo. Um, and it was really uh, an, a, a at that age, having my first job in conservation, that really shaped my uh, my ethos, my way of thinking, and really this this perspective of putting people at the center of of, of conservation. And and as I spent a number of years there, I think about six years, um, it sort of made me th really think about what 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 are zoos actually for? Like, what what is what is the role of a zoo? And um, in this presentation, because I still feel much part of this community. I'm, I hope you allow me to use, use to sp speak as we, as, as, as part of this, this same group, because I still very much feel part of, of the community, even if I'm, I haven't been very active in the last few years. So if you've been to Lisbon Zoo, you wouldn't guess it necessarily, but Lisbon Zoo is about 150 years old, just a little bit under that. Um, and Lisbon Zoo, as many other zoos, has a historical legacy. And that legacy is... Um, a reason for us to be proud, but also presents challenges. Challenges like the fact that many of the enclosures that were designed 50, 60, 70 years ago were not up to the same standards as we today think of when we think about a zoo, when we think about a park that has animals inside. Um, and so, of course, if you go today to Lisbon Zoo, this is not what you see. You, the picture is very different. The picture is something like this. Right? So it's very much the paradigm is shifted. 
the enclosures where the animals are, are very different, clearly geared much more towards the animal and the well-being of the animal, less towards this visitor-centric experience. So things have changed dramatically. Even in, in within just the, the 20 years since I first started working there and today, differences are staggering. Now, at the same time while I was uh, at Lisbon Zoo, I was 17, 18, I started learning about EUTs. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really incredible was the amount of work that went into them. But not just the work in terms of labor, just work in terms of the, the science, the technical aspects, just the management, all the genetics that went into managing these populations. It was really an incredibly technical world, right? There's a lot of science that goes into this. Right? It's a very technical process. And I thought that was, that was quite interesting. And it was interesting because when I myself looked at my own work, I didn't necessarily see that much of a technical angle to it. So a lot of the work that I did, or, or as we see more and more education coming up in, um, in, in zoos, and, and we look at these strategies, we see education coming more and more um, a selling point for zoos. Zoos saying, we're doing education, this is really part of our mission, this is really part of who we are. It's not just about animals, it's also about the people. Um, but as I was working, at the same time I was working in Lisbon, so I was doing my BSc at the time, um, University of Lisbon in, in environmental biology, and of course, a, as a anyone that does environmental biology, I think anywhere in the world, not just in Lisbon, um, it's you, you want to interact with animals. You want to have some, spend some time thinking about animals, looking at animals, and so I, I volunteered to do some animal behavior work. And you know, once again, just like with the EUTs work, I was really. It was quite remarkable, right? The amount of data that was required to make some of these decisions on husbandry of the animal, um, how much time of observation it was. I had to spend looking at this hornbill. You know, is he going to do this? Move towards the left, move towards the right. You know, it was really it was tremendous the amount of detail that was demanded, and rightly so, and rightly so. And I thought that this is the way we should be doing it. We should really be, really throwing all this data at these decisions because these decisions are important. Now. The paradox I find myself in, and that really drove me to move into the work that I'm doing today, is that, uh, as I just described to you, when it came to managing animals, when it came to decisions about where the animals go, what they do, do they, should we have the animals more like this or more like that, and there, were, there was a lot of technical effort involved, a lot of information collected, a lot of rigor, a lot of protocols to be followed, a lot of evidence that had to be collected. But when I thought of my own work with people, that level of demand didn't seem to be there necessarily. A lot of the time, I would talk about my own, my, my own work, and I would reflect on it, and I would say, oh, you know, I think this is probably going okay because the children look pretty happy. Or the parents said that they really enjoyed, you know, they talk about the rhino all the time now. Or, or this kid said, oh, this is the best afternoon of my life. Right, and, and I sort of went, okay, I mean, that must mean that we're doing things right. right but that's a st strong contrast with all the other work that was going on and some of it that I was directly involved in. And that sort of really brought me to the path and to the, to the um, reflections that I'm hoping to discuss with you all today. So really, I guess my question is, why are we treating people and animals when they're both part of zoos, the, the mission of a zoo, they both say that with this both, these are both objectives that we have. How, wh why is it that there's such big differences in the way that we treat both of the sides of, of the coin, right? Um, and I think more even so, if we think about why species go extinct, right? So that, that graph over there is the, just the a, a simple, um, shows you some data on extinction causes and number of species or percentage of s extinctions that are driven by the different causes. Now, you know, can anyone tell me which of these four is not immediately linked to behavior, to human behavior? Anyone? Can anyone name one of those four that is not linked to human behavior? Yeah, I think, I think that's fair because, because they're all, they're all deeply connected with the decisions all of us, the seven billion people on Earth, make every day, right? And so recognizing that, recognizing that species go extinct because of what people do, 
it seems clear that, if anything, we need to really, um, sorry, we need to really, um, aw- really give the people side of the equation just as much effort and as much data and as much evidence as we give all the other parts of the work that Rizu does. And so, as we as we talk about as we, as we talk about zoos and we talk about the education mission of zoos and we talk about how many millions of visitors we have, I often wonder what is the inform- what is the evidence that we have to really say yes, we are achieving our mission, we're having some conservation impact, we're really shifting behavior. And there was an article a- as I was preparing. <laughs> luckily, luckily, um, as I was preparing for for this talk. As I was scouring the literature to see what, what, what was out there, there was an article that caught my, my attention. This one. Some of you might have seen it. And it talks exactly about this. It talks basically about what are the standards that w- or evaluation standards that are being used uh, when it comes to education in zoos and aquaria. Now, I thought that was pretty interesting. It's a, it's a nice read. I recommend it. Um, but I want to focus on a couple of things. On, on this this paper, um, and I think the first one is that at one point it talks about some of the the vast majority of quantitative studies have weak methods when it comes to how robust the how robust they are, how the robustness of the evidence that is produced. And I think that must give us pause, right? Again, you know, if we think about if I think back to my days of looking at hornbills for many hours, um, how much effort we're putting. Into into all the all the management that goes with the animal collections and how much we um, are on on the human side. What what's that? Why are, why is that different for zoos? Um, and I also want to. I think there are three broader lessons that I want to I want to I want to leave you with from that particular piece of research. And and I think we could. And I'll be happy to hear your or your thoughts uh, on on this later on. So the first one is, you know, real estate is location, location, location. And to me, education in zoos has to be behavior, behavior, behavior. So what I mean by that is that very often we we think about we think about knowledge objectives and how great it is that people are learning about the natural environment. And I, you know, I couldn't be more supportive of that. Um, but I think sometimes we have this um, perception that uh, knowledge works a little bit like this. We give people information um, because they know the tiger is in danger, then they, we're going to change their attitudes towards the tiger, and that means that they're going to change their behavior and they're not going to perform a certain behavior because they now understand that the tiger is in danger based on this information that we gave them. When actually things are a bit more complicated than that. And, and, we, and, and this really, yeah, okay, information is important. It might get us one step up the, the ladder, but it doesn't really mean very much when it comes to how far up the ladder we're going to get. We might just stay stuck at the very first step. And I think that's important to recognize, right? So I really want to, I think we, we should be focusing a lot more on that, that side of the equation um, because that's really where, where the impact is, right? So when, when, when changes manifest themselves in the real world in the form of behavior, things that happen, people doing something, that's when we start seeing impact. Everything else, you know, it's really great that people have positive attitudes and, uh, of course, what perceptions people have are very powerful, but only once they manifest themselves in the real world as an act of some description, a behavior of some type, can they actually deliver improved conservation outcomes. And so I think that's one thing um, I, I want to reflect on. The second thing that I thought was interesting was how, um, and, and I, I understand the appeal, you know, zoos have millions of people. And that, that's a big number, a million, many millions, many zeros to it. It's powerful. Right? Uh, you know, even, even for someone like me who's heard it many times, every time I hear it, I, it sort of gives me pause. You know, wow, I mean, really can, can make a difference. But I always thought it was, I know, ironic that if you go through a lot of these uh, studies that are reviewed in the, the article that I show you, a lot of them use very s- quite, quite small samples. Right? So how does that translate? How do we translate between some of the research that's done that has that actually uses quite small groups groups of people, and then the millions of people that we have th- coming through our gates? So there's a discrepancy there. Um, and I also think that it's important for us to realize, 
uh, what, what, what it means to work with a representative sample of our visitors versus with a very specific group. So very often we have situations where you know, research is done with very, very specific groups of people. And that, of course, doesn't translate into the many millions that go through the gates, right? So we cannot necessarily make a, a link between what we find with very, very particular primary school children in Paris um, to the millions of people that go through the, the entrance of the zoo every year. And I think that also weakens our argument, also means that we are not as ready as able to say, this is actually what we're delivering in terms of impact. And uh, I think lastly, and the point I wanted to, to, to make also a broader point around cause and effect, right? So cause and effect very often, and, and this, this is not something that, not none of these things are, are things that are just specific to zoo education. I want to highlight that as well. These are challenges that come, I come across in other areas that I work with. Um, but I want to, just a minute, I'm going to highlight just why I think it's, it's more important in this particular context we're in today than in many other areas that I, I work in. Um, in terms of cause and effect, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty tempting sometimes to say, oh, we've seen change A, it must be because of action B that we've, we've, we've taken. It must be because of this program that we're developing. It must be because of this other thing that we're undertaking, right? Um, but actually, determining cause and effect is a really tricky thing um, because as individuals, we are exposed to hundreds of different types of influences every day. Every day, there's hundreds of things that try to change my behavior in some way or another, right? And to pinpoint one particular cause for one particular effect is a little bit trickier than it seems, right? And so one of my, one of my, my favorite sort of satirical stories is the story of Mr. Garrison. You might know Mr. Garrison. Uh, comes with his sidekick, Mr. Hat, just there. Um, and so Mr. Garrison, as you know, is a teacher... Um, he has a class that he works with, right? Um, and Mr. Garrison really loves Mr. Hat. And he, he, he says, well, you know, Mr. Hat, you're so amazing that when you're in the classroom, it's not just that the students learn more, it's that actually the students grow taller. That's really remarkable about you, Mr. Hat. I really, I think it's amazing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some research to prove that Mr. Hat is an incredible, you know, it's just that incredible, it's just really amazing, right? So what Mr. Garrison does, he takes the students, right, at the beginning of the year, and he measures their height, um, and then he goes back uh, at the end of the year, and he measures the students back again, right? And what does he conclude? He concludes that Mr. Hat is amazing because the students all grew, right? That is the power of Mr. Hat. Now, of course, you know, this is a little bit of, of satire just to say that, you know, with one of the one of the key things that the study shows is that pre post experimental designs are very very popular in the way that zoo um, education is evaluated, but of course things like that lend themselves to easily to um, to be to, to bias, right? So if you're going to be serious about you want to be with the extra extra ex extra mile and really being able to pinpoint what the cause and the effect of the programs that we're doing, we need to go a little bit further. We need to I think go a little bit. Um, a little bit of extra legwork. Um, and, and that could be as simple as having a control group, right? A control group that's comparable. Many of us work with schools, for example, um, thinking about what are the groups that if, I, if I'm looking with 10 classrooms, maybe I'll work with five first and then second one. And that allows me to use the second group as a control for the first, if they're staggered in time, for example. Uh, there are multiple strategies, and I'll go back to that in just a minute. So. Yeah, so causality, I think, is something else that we all need to think about, right? Not just documenting the changes, but then being able to pinpoint and say, yeah, this change, we know it's changed, the change matters, and guess what? We have reasonable evidence to, to say that this is driven by the work that we do. Now, to my last, my last um, bit of my talk, um, I want to talk about the importance of being proactive and not reactive. And... Um, the reason for that, and, and so why, 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 why is this important? Why are we talking about all of this? Um, of course, all of you that have the education standards under your pillow, you know all about all about them. Um, all of this is talked about in education standards. So actually, and I'll let me just pause for a second to give a shout out to the the, the team who's um, was behind developing them. I was seriously impressed 
um, with, with, the, with, the, with the content. I think very often it is easy to develop standards that are not very ambitious, but these standards are ambitious, and if they are really adopted, I think it would make a world of difference. I think if they are, if they are fully adopted, then there won't be any more talks like this one ever again at education conferences, which I think is the best place to be. Um, but I also, at the same time, you know, why should you listen to me, right? I mean, I'm, I, you know, at least at least half of my time I sit in this in university in Oxford. <laughs> it, uh, you know, it's not really like it's the real world anyway. Um, but I do think that is there's something to just thinking about, you know, trying to be inside but also outside of the zoo community. There is something that um, uh, gives me a little bit of pause to reflect, and that is that is that. Um, more and more I see the education role of zoos being a um, public question. As, as zoos make education more and more of their mission, as zoos make clear and clear that education is now within their remit, they feel that education is really important for them, um, we have questions like that come up. Right? And I, I feel that the way to deal with these questions, with these issues, and I feel that this is perhaps going to be more of a, in the next 10 years, it's probably going to be more of a debate than probably, or, or a similar debate than there was with animal, uh, animal captivity, animal ca the keeping of animals in captivity. Um, we'll need to do better. We need to do, we need to be prepared to have this discussion. And I feel that the way to be prepared is to be proactive and to shape the perceptions of our public that we engage with from the beginning, right? Um, if I tell you that I see a duck, right, even those of you who are seeing a rabbit probably already see a duck already, right? So and that's, that's the difference of having, having the first, being, being already being prepared for the discussion, bringing our, uh, our message to the table from the beginning, uh, as opposed to expecting, um, expecting uh, um, the question to be asked and then trying to find the answer after that, after the fact. And I think that this, this, the reason this is important is because I really do feel that answering this question, what is the educational value of zoos, is going to be a key thing in defining how people perceive zoos and it's going to ultimately affect or impact um, foot traffic, how, people, how, pe how many people come to these parks, people, um, how do they relate to zoos, how do they see the role of zoos in society. And so I, f I feel strongly that um, it is now it is now the time to get ahead and to have that and be prepared for, the, for those conversations, which, of course, are probably not going to be, are going to require a lot of work and preparation, but better to um, get, uh, get in front of it. And so I guess really, in summary, um, what I'm putting forward is that it's not so much that evaluation and evidence is, is just a, a nice thing to have, you know. I feel like sometimes you say, "Oh, you know, I do all this work, um, but we don't really have time to evaluate." Right? I mean, imagine if if I was a keeper and I said, "Oh, you know, on Thursdays and Fridays, animals don't eat because you know I'm still busy. It's really not, you know, not possible. It's really not something I can do." That's really not an option, right? That's really not something a keeper can do. You just go, "Oh, yeah, no, it's really not possible." Right? I think it's. I think we need to shift the paradigm into saying, oh, you know, evaluation and evidence for impact, it's a nice thing to have, you know, good on you, it's a sort of pat in the back type situation. We recognize that it really is a must-have, just as a part of doing education, as a, as a part of zoo education programs. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't skip other stages of the process, why skip this one, right? Um, and so I think that's really uh, uh, one of the take-homes that I want to, to get across today is this idea that it's no longer a nice to have, it's a must have if we're going to be able to be present and be a part of these big conversations uh, about the role of zoos in, in the next 10 years. Now, this has already happened with animal collections, right? So this is, this is a paper, let me just give you the, the, the down low on this. Um, you know, these are this is the longevity of animals, same species, wild in, in zoos, um, this is for two particular groups of, of mammals. This is from a paper that I just uh, Googled quickly. Um, th the point I want to make with this is that this is, this is behind this graph is a lot of information, right? 
number, average number of years, mean number of years that different animals from different genders survive in captivity in the wild, right? This is not about how many belly rubs the animals get or how excited they are in the morning or any sort of, no, this is hard number of years living type indicators, right? So in the same way, you know, I think we can, if we, if we think about how far disease has come in collecting all this information on animal welfare, collecting all this information on survival rates, collecting all this information about the animals and to ensure that, that they're given the best possible care, then all I'm saying is that we need to follow the same route with all the work that we do in education and interacting with visitors and driving behavior change. Now, as I was, I was saying, you know, I want to I want to I want to pause for a second and just say that this is this is really not a unique um, challenge of, of zoo education in zoos. There's a lot of there are a lot of other fields. For example, I work a lot in wildlife trade and uh, reduction of demand for wild illegal wildlife trade products, and we have similar challenges. Right? We have we have definitely similar challenges. So it's not it's not it's not you know the zoo educator alone in the braving the the storm. It's really you know an, a, a challenge that is that cuts across many fields um, that interact with human behavior. And and I also want to make I want to leave this also on, on on a positive note and say don't try to read this. It's not important. Um, all all I want you to get from this slide is this. This is a list of barriers from the uh, paper that I mentioned earlier. But even more, much more important than that, this is a list of papers already in the literature from zoo educators that address those barriers, right? So it's not like, you know, we, n we need some sort of to, to, to bring in all these external expertise. It's not like we there's anything new to be learned. It's really about mainstreaming best practices that are already within our community. These papers by zoo educators already address e all except one um, of the challenges that were laid out in this, in this review paper, right? So the knowledge is there, the capacity exists. People know what you should be doing, there's the standards. It's really about, this is gonna get done. And so I wanna finish with a story, or, or, or almost finish with a story. Um, and that is that, um, you know, there's this story, uh, apocryphal, ap apocryphal story about Julius Caesar and his wife Pompeia. Um, where um, at one point in Rome, there was this rumor that Caesar's wife had met with another man. And uh, Caesar went and he divorced her on the spot. Right? They divorced, he divorced her immediately. Now, she was tried for adultery, and Caesar was called to come to the court, and the judge asked him, so, okay, so, um, you know, what, 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 what do you know about this story? What, what is your... What is your version of the facts? And Caesar just said, you know, actually I know nothing about this. I have no idea what happened. And the judge asked him, why, why would you divorce your wife if you don't know anything about what happened? Why, why would you do that? And he said, well, for the wife of Caesar, even just being s a suspect of something is bad enough. So the wife of Caesar should not even be under sus or any kind of suspicion. right?" And that's w what I want to get with that is that if we want to get evidence that re resonates, outside of our own community, well I think we're going to have to do a couple of things. And I'm going to give three things that I think we need to engage with in order just not to produce information, but produce information that can actually resonate outside our own, our own community. Because, of course, and all of you experienced much more than I have, some of these debates are adversarial, right? So it's not just about producing uh, information that the community can believe in and that we can all take on board. It's really producing information that can be taken outside um, and we can can be seen and perceived as robust, believable, strong. So I think one thing is, um, I think one process to take advantage of is the, the peer review process. I was really, really happy that EASA now has an um, open access journal, uh, which is also a great name, Jazar, right? Which, is, which I thought was, was a great, great choice. Um, I think that's going to be a, a really important thing to, um, to interact with. Um, those types of, of um, those types of, of outlets or those types of channels, and this is because the peer review process does does mean that you can present the type this type of knowledge with a little bit different sort of authority. Um, so I would encourage you all to um, and, and and I I do know how 
how incredibly morose and how burdensome it can be to interact with journals and go through peer reviews and all of that. But I do think we need to think about, again, getting ahead of the curve and how the information that we present is going to be perceived outside of this room. And that's one relatively, well, I shouldn't say painless, but a uh, way of, of having that real guarantee. I mean, the other one is thinking about interacting, and this is all in the standards, which I'm you know, excited to report, um, thinking about interacting with third parties like academics. Because for us, and now I'm taking off my zoo hat and putting on my academic hat, um, for us, our interest is really in the process, not in the result. And that means that we can contribute in different ways from someone who is, of course, very has vested interest in making sure that the program is a success, right? Interacting with a third party, someone who's independent, who can think about it more impartially, can be an important, an important contribution. Um, and also, I mean, universities all, all around the world have students that need to do uh, work, thesis work, and that can be an important resource as well. And, of course, um, very much making sure that the, the work is done and shared with other, other institutions, with other colleagues and outside of, outside of, the, um, of the zoo world. I was um, very, very happy to hear that one of the articles that was selected by um, Ifan Wee was one of the was research about something that is not necessarily a great discussion topic, mortality of animals in zoos, right? And this is the same thing when it comes to education. Changing human behavior is really difficult. Invariably, there will be things that don't work out just as we would like as we hoped they would. And that's okay, that's, that's a normal thing and that's expected. Um, and I think that's another, this having this open sort of sharing and ability to talk about things that necessarily maybe don't necessarily exactly conform to what we expected will give a lot more robustness to uh, the available evidence. Right? Because one of the things that I'm always critical about conservation work and behavior change work in general is that we have this sort of dystopia where everyone is succeeding all the time, yet the problem still remains the same, right? which is an, an unusual situation to be in, which of course then asks ask the question, if we know we're not succeeding all the time, what happens to the information that we think they're not successful and what does that mean about all of us as a community right? um, of, cons cons of conservation efforts? So I think this, this sharing of information really is, really is something that um, that will uh, increase the credibility of, of all of us as a community as we move forward. So le the last thing I want to say um, uh, is that one of the roles of IAZA that I see is uh, the supporting of providing a support in the application of these standards. Of course, standards set out what the, what the ideals are, but how do you make that actually come true? I think that I see a lot of organizations that share similar programs? Is there potential for um, EASA to help to support the development of evaluation techniques and instruments and practices for some of the most common programs, for example, and really help kickstart some of this initial, um, some of this initial work, um, which of course would have the even added uh, strength of not being done by a single institution, but being done by a multitude of institutions, which of course means that uh, whatever we say has um, can be much much stronger, and so I think there's something there to think about how we how we make sure that this steps from the standards. I think at a really wonderful place to begin. How does that how does that then uh, get scaled up from individual institutions to the to the big collective? And so, so if you remember only one thing from everything I've just told you. Um, let it be this. Um, I really feel that education and the ability to justify and to provide evidence for the educational world of zoos is going to be one of the things that's going to define uh, how society perceives zoological parks in the next 10 years. Um, the way to approach this, in my view, is not so much by ignoring it and waiting for, that for the issue to come to us again, it's really by gathering the information and being able to answer, having a ready, answer ready whenever this knocks on our door and say, actually, you'll, s you'll find that this is the evidence that we have, this is the difference that we're making. And just like if you go back 50 years, 
through Europe's zoos, you would have images like this, which now have become things like that. Um, I think that's the, the change that we need to see and uh, the, the leap that we need to take. Um, and I think that's gonna only that's gonna require a lot of a lot of social science and a lot of technical input, just like we had with um, the management of animal collections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diogo. I have to say something. I remember one more thing from you. That's the story about Mr. Greg and Mr. Hat. <laughs> okay, I think we have uh, at least five more minutes for questions now. So where are all the questions? I have too much. Wait a minute, I'm running. There you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. My question is very simple. Uh, in the first uh, half of it, you sh you've shown a graphic of the four causes of extinction. What's your source for that? No, no, oh, it is now. Yeah, so sorry, that's an article in conservation biology. I don't know the title off the top of my head because I've been using it for uh, so long. Um, but if you drop, me if you give me your card, I'll fish out the reference for you. Great, yeah, thank Sorry, you. it's not a great answer, but hopefully, yeah, sorry. Ah, here we go, here we go, very volunteer up Hi. front, yes, great. Um, yeah, thanks for your talk, very interesting. Um, I was just wondering if you agree with me that it's not that we need to prove evidence for the outside world, but first and foremost for ourselves, that we need to know what we are doing. And then, of course, if, if the outside world are attacking us, um, that we have some proof. But I would like to know myself if that's what I'm doing, if it's really working. Thank you, yeah, I think that's a wonderful, I agree with you. Um, I do think, though, that uh, sometimes there is, yeah, so I think you're right. I think you're right, period. However, I will also add that um, very often I'm in conversations where um, it, I get the sense that very often people say, we already know it's working. I already know, I don't need evidence because I know that's working because I do this every day. I have a lot of conversations like that and so I'm really happy to hear that um, in, in, you know, in your instance, um, in your, in, in your instance, you know, you feel like the evidence is important internally as well, which I would completely agree. The reason I emphasized more external audiences is because I felt that that's where most people agree. And whereas internally, so as I was saying, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm involved in conversations where people just flat out tell me, oh, no, 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 I, for my institution, I know it's working because I I'm do it every day. I don't need any evidence, which, of course, I would disagree with, but... Um, you know, there you go. Thanks. We have at least to get the three questions. At least. Ah, uh, here we go. Yes. Thank you. Uh, maybe slightly controversial, but I've heard Great. from uh, academics working mostly on animal behavior style research that they sometimes find it's quite frustrating to get into zoos to do research. I'm not sure if that's the same for social research, but. Mm -hmm. As an academic, do you have any suggestions for how zoos can actually make themselves more appealing as research partners for universities? Ah, what a one that's a great question. Um, so I will say that um, that's a uh, 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 <laughs> this is the short version of the question. There's a much longer question uh, answer I can give you. I would just say that it's important to recognize just academics have different incentives than zoos have. Um, and I think for both the academic side and the zoo side, uh, there would be the need to, to adapt a little bit. Um, I think, for example, one challenge that I found um, is, uh, which is around, um, uh, so for example, for an academic, it will most likely be so unacceptable to tell an academic, oh, I wanna, I wanna know what the results of the study are, and then I'll decide if you get to publish it or not, right? But that's, that's a conversation that happens. You know, uh, I, I've, I've seen happen, for example, with working with zoos, where they will say, actually, yeah, we'll let you do the work, but we get to decide if you publish it or not at the end, which, of course, for an academic will be a difficult, um, will be a difficult uh, conversation to have. 
Um, I, I, I think I think maybe the easiest thing would be for zoos to have, and I don't know if this is common practice or not, so this is my knowledge gap, clear identified research priorities and research questions. I think that would probably be make it easier for academics to establish common ground immediately and say, oh yeah, this is a question I'm interested in, or this is not something that I'm interested in. Um, that's maybe, those two things, I think, are the two things that come to mind. One, clearly established research priorities from the zoo side, and then um, coming up with a framework, it might be a memorandum of understanding, it might be some other thing, um, that provides safety for the institution so that there's no, of course, you know, we understand that research is, information is power, um, so that the zoo can be safe, safeguarded in, in the way that information is reported, but at the same time, the academic has freedom to publish um, the, you know, whatever research he or he has carried out. So I think those would be maybe the two, two things that come to mind, you know, very quickly. But I think, you know, maybe is that is that room for, you know, more of a sort of uh, collective sort of standards or I don't know. But uh, I would certainly like to see. I, I think it's a huge untapped opportunity. Zoos are such wonderful research platforms. You know. Yes. Oh yeah, we're getting we're getting momentum now. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, from your presentation, there's one thing that really struck my mind. Why do we always succeed, yet the problem is still the same? Mm. And yes, time and again, we present wonderful education programs of what we are doing in our different facilities, but the animal population still goes down. So from the academic point of view, is there something we should be di doing different from what we've been doing? Why do we have wonderful programs in zoos and aquariums, and yet the problem is still the same? Mm -hmm. So, which new things do we need to do? Which so models? So, I'm, I'm I'm unable to answer that question truly, but but I, I will just say something. Which I'll just I'll just say something. I th I think I think maybe we sometimes not focused on the right types of indicators. So for example, I'll give you an example. When it comes to um, the big EASA campaigns, for example, um, very often we report uh, how much money was invested, we report how many institutions participated, how many people were involved. Actually, what I want to know is how many birds, how many, uh, how many more birds do we have because of that campaign? And, and I, recognize, I recognize the monstrosity of the task that something like that would be. But it's not an impossible task. It's not impossible to have some 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 sense. Yeah, well there'll be a, 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 a margin of error around that estimate. Okay, and I I, I'm ha I can I can deal with that. But what I want to know is what is the actual biodiversity gain that was that happened, right? And so I think so I think it's maybe thinking about it in those terms and thinking about it in terms of biodiversity gain, biodiversity loss. Um, what was the what's the difference that it makes that we can um, start answering some of those questions of how is it that all of these things happen and yet we have biodiversity losses? I mean, the other thing is, of course, to 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 realize that maybe it would just be even worse if there wasn't any ether, right? So that's the other thing to realize is that yeah, maybe all of these things happen and yet we have biodiversity losses, but if they didn't happen, it would be even worse, right? So. Again, these exercises are not, you know, m just m my personal preference. These are not things we, we, we have to completely speculate about. We could have data thrown into this, and, and um, we, could, we could have, have some educated guesses about what this looks like, and I think maybe, maybe, maybe we should. Um, but I, I also do realize that that's maybe because I sit half of my time in Oxford, and I like playing around with data. Um, maybe that's not the reality that other people live in, and I, I you know, I can... I can understand that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Yogo. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the last question. And um, if you want to talk more to Diogo, it's time for soon, at least, a break. And uh, yes, it's time for the poster session and the break now. And uh, I think we have to be back here in, uh, let's say, 35 minutes, 11.20. That's 35 minutes. I think that's enough. 
So stretch your legs. <laughs>